testing on YouTube, testing on YouTube. Testing on YouTube, testing on YouTube. All right, YouTube is working, nice. Now we just need X. How's it going, Josh Phillips? The Battle of the Mambas begins shortly. It's like all your favorite battle scenes in movies, but not as cool. <laughs> uh, let's move this here. Not that. How's it going, a tool? How's it going, James? How's it going, hoo hoo boss? Yeah, I try not to be super promotional. You know, I've noticed other YouTubers will have basically accounts that they use to spam on Reddit every single time they post videos and stuff, but I don't know, that, that feels kind of cringe. So I try not to post, but sometimes it's just can't help it, you know, I get excited over my own content and I feel like I want to share. All right, we're going to start here shortly. I think the X is going to work. I multi-stream to YouTube, X, and Twitch. So basically the way it works, X is the one that is the hardest to get going. Why is it not live? Come on. Come on. Oh, it's for some reason it's set to 8.30. One second, let me just switch it. Come up here, set this. Needs to be 8 a.m. Maybe can I do 8.01? 8.01? 8.02? Jesus Christ, live debugging. Oh my God. Can I do 8.05? Okay. 8.05? God. Okay, whatever. I think we're just going to go and then the Twitter one will bump in. I can't find the Twitch link. So, uh, all the notes that I do for my streams are in this GitHub repo called StreamDocs, which is the link that's underneath the uh, my name down here. You see that? But basically for every single stream I have a little markdown file and then in that markdown file you should be able to find the uh, YouTube link, the X or Twitter link, the Twitch link, links to the papers, links to the different diagrams I have to show, links to dot data sets, basically all the different things I will reference. Hoo hoo boss, is that a is that a reference to my name? Hugo Boss? Okay, let's announce the formal starting of this stream and then we'll get started. All right, welcome to another Hoopo stream. Today we're going to be diving into the world of vision architectures, specifically uh, what are called vision mambas. Mamba is a, a state space model 
Think of it like an alternative to a transformer or a convnet. And they got popular for language models, right? Sequence to sequence uh, models in the text space. But now you're starting to see them being used in the vision space. So we're going to go ahead and check out two different papers here. And we're going to kind of do it like in a head-to-head -head manner. So basically, you have two different groups of researchers releasing Mamba vision papers basically at the same time here. You have 17th January 2024, and then you have the 18th of January 2024. So as soon as I kind of saw that, I was like, you know what? This sounds like uh, we should put them head-to-head -head and compare them, see what they did differently, and see uh, if we can come to a conclusion as to which ideas are the best from both of these papers. So that's what we're going to kind of do today. We're going to do a little head-to-head. -head. It's going to get pretty, pretty gnarly. Uh, this, These papers are very uh, detailed and kind of intricate. So it's kind of like taking apart VCRs, you know? <laughs> if that's kind of your jam, you're going to have fun. But if you're here for more kind of high-level stuff, this might be a little bit too technical for you. So... Let's get started. So we have VMAMBA, which stands for Visual Mamba, which is a visual state space model. The state space model is the type of model that is a Mamba. Mamba is the name of the state space model. And then this is the visual version of it. This is a paper that comes out of three different kind of groups here. You got UCAS. UCAS stands for University of Chinese Academy of Sciences, which is basically a group in Beijing of China. Beijing, China, which is the capital of China. And then you have Huawei Inc. and Pengchen Lab. So that's one of the first groups here. Uh, the second paper is called Vision Mamba, Efficient Visual Representation Learning with Bidirectional State Space Model. So again, the Mamba is the State Space Model. The bidirectional, we're going to see exactly what it means, but it's basically uh, one of the tricks that they do in this paper that they do actually differently in this paper. So that's one of the interesting differences. And visual representation learning is just uh, using learning techniques to learn uh, representations of vision, right? So you're basically, the whole point of these models is they're trying to compress a image into some kind of vector, and that vector represents the content of that image, and then you're going to judge the quality of that vector, or sometimes called a feature, that represents that image or a representation of that image, right, by uh looking at how good it is for some pretty generic tasks such as classification, semantic segmentation, detection, and instance segmentation. So these are kind of classic computer vision tasks, and uh, they're being used as basically benchmarks to look at how the quality of the vision rep visual representations that come out of these V-Mambas compare to something like a CNN and a vision transformer. Okay, so... The second paper is from Huazhong University of Science and Technology, so a little academic group, Horizon Robotics, and then the Beijing Academy of Artificial Intelligence. So Horizon Robotics, I had to look this up, still looking. It's a basically an autonomous vehicle company. It started in 2016, so they've been around for quite some time. They've raised a bunch of money. They raised like a Series C at some point, like relatively recently. So th these guys have been around for a while. But the important thing to, to look here is that these guys are uh, an autonomous vehicle company, so they're very interested with basically... Uh, trying to run vision systems with a very small compute footprint, right? So uh, mo most of the time when you use, for example, GPT or these things here like perplexity, you, you can attach an image, but the computing, uh, the compute that's going, that's being used to basically analyze that image with some kind of a VIT is being done in uh, a server, right? You're accessing the model via API, but you can't do that for autonomous vehicles. When you're doing anything with autonomous vehicles, it needs a very, very fast uh, latency. It needs to be basically running on the edge or on the actual car itself. So you need to have the actual GPU in the car. And not only do you need to have the actual GPU in the car, but you also need that to be extremely quick and extremely efficient, right? So it makes sense that the uh, team at Horizon Robotics would be interested in kind of different architectures for computer vision that are more efficient. And that is the, the key word here, 
uh, and what really stands out for these models, right? The the mamba models, the reason they chose the word mamba is because a mamba is a type of snake that's very fast. So these models, you know, they're not quite as good as VITs and even very big convnets, but they're faster, and that's really the whole uh, the whole shtick. So here, for example, right right off the bat, one of the first charts that they put here is a speed comparison uh, frames per second with log scale. So you can see here that the uh, Vim, they call it Vim, which kind of is unfortunate because Vim is also the name of a coding IDE. But uh, you can see it's faster here than a DEIT. A DEIT, I have it pulled up here, comes from this paper. This is a 2021 paper where basically a DEIT is a transformer that has been distilled from a ConvNet. Here you see this distillation loss coming in through here, and then you have a just standard cross entropy loss. But it's basically a vision transformer that has this extra distillation token. So it's kind of representative of what you would expect with a vision transformer. And vision transformers, right, have this quadratic complexity res with respect to the input sequence length or the, uh, in the case of images, the size of the image. So you can see here how if we look at the GPU memory, right, the vision transformer here represented by the DEIT, although there's plenty of other types of vision transformers, you can see that quadratic scaling where it very quickly, as you increase the resolution of the image, which is basically analogous to the length of the sequence in a language model, you can see how it goes oom very quickly. So you can't really use very big images with a vision transformer, but these state space models, right, these mambas, these vision mambas, they scale uh, basically linearly. So you can see you can increase the resolution of the image m to a much bigger size and still get uh, relatively okay GPU uh, memory usage, which uh, the whole reason I guess I went on this rant is why this is important is because people who are doing edge computing that ha requires very fast latency on these kind of tiny shitty GPUs that are in the back of your car, uh, that's why they're interested in these vision models. So why don't we start by reading the abstract for both of these and then we'll go from there. Okay, so convolutional neural networks, this is the first paper here, vMamba. Uh, and vision transformers stand as the two most popular foundation models for visual representation learning. So generally CNNs were more popular like five years ago and then now the vision transformers are the most popular. There are still plenty of papers that people release where they show that the CNNs are still useful, right? Like the ConvNext paper showed that CNNs are still relevant, but I think because transformers are so popular in the language space, I think people just kind of see that word transformers and they kind of like think it's just going to be better. So despite CNNs and, VIT and VITs kind of probably still being pretty much just as good for the same amount of compute, uh, VITs are more popular. While CNNs exhibit remarkable scalability with linear complexity, so CNNs do not suffer from this quadratic complexity that vision transformers suffer from uh, with respect to image resolution, which is basically the length of the input sequence, VITs surpass them in fitting capabilities despite contending with quadratic complexity. Okay, so VITs have a little bit better ability to model uh, and provide high quality visual representations, but CNNs are a little bit faster, a little bit more compute efficient. A closer inspection reveals that VITs achieve superior visual modeling through the incorporation of global receptive fields and dynamic weights. Okay. Uh, what do they mean by global receptive fields here? So in order to explain that, we're going to look at these two pictures here. So this is a, a diagram of a vision transformer. And the way that these vision transformers work is that they basically, they take your input image like this and they will cut it up into these little patches. And then they will feed these patches basically as if it was a sequence of tokens, right? So transformers, normally you're used to seeing them consume a sequence of tokens, like a sentence, right? And the words in that sentence have a specific order and it's kind of a one dimensional order, right? It goes beginning of the sentence to the end of the sentence. Images are not like that, right? Images are 2D, right? Like they're, the information is not necessarily supposed to be in this left to right sequence, but vision transformers make this kind of core assumption underline that they say, okay, well, we're just going to take the image and cut it up into these patches and feed them in left to right, top to down, and just 
we're going to make it work, right? They add this little position embedding here. Position embeddings are basically little vectors that uh, tell this transformer encoder here the kind of position of each of these little patches. So it's supposed to kind of give the transformer encoder a little bit of extra information so uh, it can hopefully kind of get rid of some of the bias that you introduce by doing this left to right, top to down uh, flattening here. But uh, we were talking about receptive fields. So the receptive field of a vision transformer is basically global in that every single patch can affect every other patch, right? So vision transformers use this uh, multi-head attention or self-attention block here, which is the core of a transformer. And in this multi-head or self-attention block, any part, any little patch here can basically uh, pay attention to any other patch, right? So that's why you get this uh, quadratic complexity because you're basically a, have a global receptive field where any patch can pay attention to any other patch. So that's both a blessing and a curse, right? The blessing is that you have this global receptive field. Every part of the image is basically looking at every other part of the image. But the negative is that it takes a lot of memory and compute to do that. Covnets do not do that. So here you have a representation. This just looks like three squares, but covnets are basically uh, these kernels and they kind of convolve. That's where the convolution comes from. They convolve across the image. And as you go higher and higher up in a convolutional neural network, the uh, you you basically reduce the size, right? So you reduce the height and width, and you start increasing this channel uh, dimension, which is kind of the feature dimension. So you get more and more abstract representations, but uh, you also have this issue where the receptive field of as you go higher and higher up this convnet hierarchy basically gets smaller. So this particular uh, part of the covenant, for example, here at a higher level does not have a global receptive field, right? It's only really paying attention to some subset of the fields like underneath it, right? So that's kind of a trade-off between CNNs and VITs where vision transformers, because of this attention mechanism, basically have effectively a global receptive field versus covnets because they're kind of this hierarchy with uh, smaller and smaller dimensions as you get to the top, right? The top of the pyramid is very small compared to the base of the pyramid. You have a kind of a, uh, you don't have this global receptive field anymore. You're, you're kind of like limiting the receptive field to, to a local area. Okay, so that's what they're mentioning here with the uh, uh, global receptive field. So the dynamic weights, which is another property of the VITs, refers to the fact that uh, in a ConvNet, uh, let's go back to our little ConvNet diagram here, you're convolving a kernel across the entire image. So basically you have these kernels, right, that you learn over time and then you're basically applying every single one of those learned feature kernels, right, across. Let me see if I can find a better image of that. Feature maps CNNs. Yeah, there's pretty cool diagrams of these and people used to hand design these, which is pretty cool. Yeah, this is like a good example right here. Open image and new tab. W, scroll in. So when you're using a covnet, the covnet is basically taking each of these little squares, right, and then uh, convolving it across your entire image. So you can think of these as being almost fixed weights that are being used with the image regardless of what the image is versus in a uh, VIT, the, the weights are more dynamic in that you're basically what comes out of this multi-head attention then gets fed into this MLP, but what, what comes out of this multi-head attention is a lot more uh, responsive to the actual uh, kind of image itself. So it's a little bit more dynamic compared to the kind of uh, ConvNet, which is a little bit more static, where it's just kind of like these the same feature maps just being used on the image over and over again. Okay. Uh, Back to this abstract. This observation motivates us to propose a novel architecture that inherits these components while enhancing computational efficiency. So that's the advantage of these state space models is the computational efficiency. So they're basically constantly going to be advertising that in this paper. To this end, we draw state space model, which achieves linear complexity without sacrificing global, refect global receptive fields, right? So it has a little bit of both uh, parts here. It has the linear complexity of CNNs, but then it has the global receptive fields of a VIT. 
To address the encounter direction sensitive issue, we introduce a cross scan module to traverse the spatial domain and convert any non causal visual image into an ordered patch sequences. So, ordered patch sequences is this part here, right? It's a, uh, ooh, not that part, it's this. So, here's an ordered sequence of patches. It's ordered sequence of patches. And they're going to be doing something cool with this cross scan module to prevent this kind of bias that we saw earlier where in a VIT you're always going left to right and top to down, right? So there's a kind of bias there. So they're going to introduce this interesting little cross scan module to uh, fight that. Extensive experimental results substantiate that vMamba not only demonstrates promising capabilities across visual perception tasks, but also exhibits more pronounced advantages over established benchmarks such as the Im when the image resolution increases, right? So if you have linear uh, linear scaling in terms of memory complexity, then you kind of want to show off that for very big image resolutions, you're still capable of getting pretty good answers because if you tried to feed a huge image into a VIT, it would basically explode. Source code available there. Uh, we'll look at the source code for this one. So this is the abstract we just read, the vMamba paper. Uh, the source code here, they 149 stars, so not as popular as the other paper. They have, you can actually go into each of these, into the models here. Here's the vMamba. You can actually go into the vMamba and then here it is. So you can see they're just basically using Torch. Pretty basic stuff here. Uh, and the code is super recent, so two days ago yesterday. Of course, this paper was released earlier this week. Uh, Looking at now the second paper, we're going to be bouncing between these. Hopefully it doesn't get confusing, but I'll try to always mention when I'm switching papers. Recently, states-based models with efficient hardware-aware designs, i.e. Mamba, have shown great potential for long-sequence modeling, aka big images. Building efficient and generic vision backbones purely upon SSMs is an appealing direction. A generic vision backbone is basically a uh, backbone is just a model that is used to create a representation that you can then use for some downstream task, right? So a generic vision backbone is a backbone that works for classification, that works for semantic segmentation, that works for all these basically different tasks here. Representing visual data is a challenging for SSMs due to position sensitivity of visual data and the requirement of global contacts for visual understanding. So here they're saying that when you're dealing with these types of tasks, you need uh, you need to basically have a way for features that are parts of the image that are close to each other to, to have s the ability to kind of relate to each other and get information from each other. And you also need an ability to have a global uh, receptive field, right? Like everything should be able to, in some way, pull a little bit of signal from everything else. In this paper, we show that the reliance of visual representation learning on self-attention, this is the VIT uh, self-attention mechanism, is not necessary and propose a new generic vision backbone with bidirectional Mamba blocks. So bidirectional Mamba blocks are going to stand uh, in contrast to what they do in this paper, which is this cross-scan module. So that's kind of, I think, the big difference between these is that uh, scan bias, if you want to think of it that way, the way that they deal with that. Uh, this marks the image sequences with position embeddings and compresses the visual representation with bidirectional state-space models. On ImageNet classification, Coco object detection, and ADE20K semantic segmentation tasks, Vim achieves higher performance compared to well-established vision transformers like DEIT, while also demonstrating significantly improved computation and memory efficiency. So again, they're going to be talking about all this memory and compute efficiency. Blah, blah, blah. Saves a bunch of GPU memory on a particularly big image, 1248 by 1248. The results demonstrate that Vim is capable of overcoming the computation and memory constraints on performing transformer style understanding for high resolution images and it has great potential to become the next generation backbone for vision foundation models. I'm not necessarily sold on that after kind of reviewing these papers. It seems cool, but it doesn't have that name brand value that the transformers do, right? The transformers have that there's something to the transformer brand that I feel like people are going to continue to use them. Okay, so that's basically uh, the two abstracts. Let's look at the code base for this second paper. So this second paper, the Vision Mamba. This is the code base. We got a little bit more stars, 523. The code also super relative or relatively recent, but uh, code c 
coming soon. So these guys have not released the code. So I don't know. Generally, uh, the more academic a group is, the more okay they are with releasing the code. But here you have some industry people like Horizon Robotics. Maybe they're arguing and saying, hey, don't actually release the code because we want to be able to uh, raise a Series D where we argue that our internal Vision Mamba model architecture is our competitive moat, right? So maybe that's what's happening. Maybe it's just taking them a second to post the code, but uh, the Vision Mamba paper has not actually posted the code yet. Okay, so that's a little summary of the abstract, the papers, the different groups involved, and now uh, let's kind of dive into the actual uh, papers themselves. Let me take a sip of this coffee. How's it going, Aries? How's it going, Nisio? Sounds like these approaches would have been even better for video. Yeah, that's another interesting point there, Nisio, because video models right they have the additional dimension of time and if you're using something like a vit where basically now you treat time as yet another basically sequence that's quadratic as well so i think for video understanding the benefit of these kind of super efficient linear uh complexity uh state space models is probably even more so right but I don't know. We haven't seen the papers yet, so we don't know. Oh, Vision Mamba has their code on the GitHub. Okay, well, actually, wait a second. Is this it? Mamba? Setup? Mamba SSM. Models. Mixer sequence. Also, PyTorch. Okay, yeah, I guess they do have their code here. Here's the block. They call these Mamba blocks. It's the weight initialization. I guess this is the mixer model. Okay, I guess they did post their code. All right, so I take it back. They did post their code. There is no internal drama. <laughs> um, let's go into the uh, introductions here. Okay, both of these introductions are very similar, so I can kind of bounce between them. They introduction section generally just kind of gives you a background on exactly what they're trying to do but because these papers are so similar they're basically almost identical uh, in terms of related works and introductions so what do we got we have VITs generally exhibit superior performance compared to CNNs which could be attributed to global receptive fields and dynamic weights okay we have uh, VITs require quadratic complexity in terms of image sizes right the image size is analogous to the length of the input sequence if you were doing a state space model for text. Uh, to tackle this issue, substantial effort has been dedicated to improving the efficiency of attention by constraining the size or the stride of the computing windows, right? So basically, a lot of people have put effort into reducing this quadratic complexity, and state space models kind of came out of this idea of like, hey, can we kind of maybe constrain the, the attention mechanism to some limited subset of the full uh, input. So the state space models come from that kind of idea, right? This, this motivation, this idea of like, hey, can we just kind of reduce this quadratic complexity and still get the same kind of powerful visual representation learning? We introduce the visual state space model denoted as VMamba. The pivotal concept is in ineffectively what the fuck? This sounds like a... Behind Mamba's success in effectively reducing attention complexity is inherited from S6. So S6 stands for Selective Scan States or Space State Sequential Model. I think this is this should be State Space Sequential Model. So selectively scanning, right? So picking the area that you scan, so your compute window, for a state space model that consumes sequences. I guess that's probably what that stands for. Uh, each element in a 1D array, aka a text sequence, to interact with any of the previously scanned samples through a compressed hidden state, right? The These state space models, right, what they're fundamentally doing is that rather than every single part of the uh, input sequence 
being able to pay attention to every single part of the input sequence, they're basically uh, only having each element in that sequence interacts with this compressed hidden state. So the hidden state basically by being smaller than the length of the sequence you get that uh, you get rid of this quadratic complexity but now the problem is that you are relying on how good this hidden state is at compressing the information and the knowledge there right so if the compressed hidden state is very lossy and you're const and you're losing information then your performance is going to decrease right so that's kind of the trade off there where you're trying to to basically bottleneck this information and hope that it doesn't destroy your final performance uh, due to the non-causal nature of visual data, and here what they're referring to is that uh, unlike a sentence, right, so in text you have a sequence of words and the words have this causal nature where basically you know that the words before your, the word that you're interested have this kind of more direct relationship, right, like the flow of left to right in a sentence has this much more causal kind of effect than when you're uh, in the visual world, right, so this is kind of going back to what we were talking about at the very beginning where this is not exactly there's no if this doesn't have like the same causality right like this seek this patch here comes right after this patch here but this patch here is like the top right corner which has like a little spire and the sky and then this patch here is like the front of the building right so there's not the kind of like the 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 causal relationship here is not as strong so this kind of one dimensional uh, kind of like sequence or flattened patch is is a little bit too strong of an assumption okay directly applying such a strategy to a patchified and flattened image would inevitably result in restricted receptive fields right because you would only be looking at the patches at the images or the patches before as the relationship against unscanned patches could not be mitigated we term this issue as the direction sensitive problem and propose to address it through a newly introduced cross scan module Instead of traversing the spatial domain of the image feature maps in a unidirectional pattern, right, this left to right, top to down, CSM adopts a four-way scanning strategy, i.e. from all four corners all across the feature map to the opposite location. This strategy ensures that each element in a feature map integrates information from all other locations in different directions, which renders a global receptive field without increasing the linear computational complexity. Okay, so they have a very nice little picture to demonstrate this. So here you have an image. This is a little picture of a snake that has been basically uh, broken up into patches, right? And then this uh, arrow represents basically what a standard uh, left to right, top to down vision transformer does, right? It feeds the uh, image patches in this kind of direction. And what they're going to be doing is they're basically going to be doing this cross scan, which means that they're going to be scanning from the left to the right and top to down, but then they're also going to be scanning from the uh, right to left and bottom to up. So they're basically trying to get rid of this bias that you have in a VIT by having every permutation of left to right, top to down, and then also having a kind of a, a, a horizontal version of that like this, where you go top to down, left to right, and then right to bottom, down to up, right to left, right? So that's what the cross-scan module in this paper is, right? It's basically an attempt to, to get rid of that inductive bias that you have in a vision transformer by just doing it in every single possible way, right? And up here at the top, this is kind of showing you what the attention mechanism looks like, right? The attention is this self-attention inside a vision transformer, and in the attention mechanism, every single uh, square, every single patch can basically pay attention to every single other patch. So for this patch in particular, right, basically any one of these other patches is you're doing some amount of compute for determining the relationship between those, right? So the, for example, here the patch with the eye has a high attention to the patch with the eye here, but then a low attention to this patch down here, a low attention to this patch here, and so on, right? Versus in a state space model, you're kind of like moving from patch to patch to patch to patch and building up this hidden state space. Uh, we'll get to that later, but they're building up this hidden state space uh, representation. And then the hidden state space representation, when you get right here, that's the thing that this little patch over here can 
uh, use to extract information. So you're basically, rather than doing it all explicitly as you do here in a VIT, you're basically doing it by accumulating this state space that traverses in basically four different ways across the image. So I think that's a good transition to talk about how they do it in this paper differently. So this is the second paper, right? The Vision Mamba paper. And in this paper, they basically do these bidirectional Mamba blocks. So they also try to get rid of this bias, right? This kind of left to right, top down bias, but they do it not as fancy as the first paper. They do it like just in both ways. So you see here, they also uh, take the image patchify it, turn it into these little patches, and then feed it. But you see here this forward conv1d and then this backward conv1d. So basically they're only doing it uh, forward, so left to right, top to down, and then backwards. So this paper only does it two ways. This paper does it four ways. So that's a difference right there. That's the difference between the cross-scan module and then the bidirectional that you're getting here, right? Where, or here, where basically both of those are trying to get rid of that inductive bias by doing it in two different ways. All right, I'm going to put these here so that I can quickly switch. Let me see. There we go. Now we can easily switch between these. Okay, nice. All right, let's go back to the uh, introduction section here. Video idea suggestion by black people. Gaussian splatting from scratch. Yeah, I wanted to do that with, uh, so I tried to do Gaussian splatting from scratch using uh, TinyGrad, but I had a really bad time because TinyGrad doesn't even have the the basic like math uh, stuff that you even need to implement Gaussian splatting. I forget which exactly, but I ran into like three different operations that didn't exist in TinyGrad, and I was like, all right, fuck that. I'm done with this project. I'm done with TinyGrad. But, I don't know, maybe it's worth implementing it in JAX or something, you know? Implementing it in PyTorch seems kind of pointless because there's already 7 million implementations of Gaussian splats in PyTorch, but maybe in JAX it could be cool. Uh, Josh Phillips. So they're ensembling the different sections of the state space together. So... Yeah, you. Uh, I don't exactly know what you mean by that question, but basically, as you move across this sequence of patches, right, you're basically accumulating this state space representation. So here, this patch here is really only performing some amount of computation with the state space representation right here, which is a compressed vector that represents everything that it's seen before, right? So you basically only need for every single patch, you only have basically four things that you need to compare against. You need to compare against the thing to the left, the thing to the right, the thing to the top, and the thing to the bottom. But the thing to the left, right, top, and bottom are basically these accumulated states vectors that are lossy, right? Because at, oh, they kind of forget information over time. So hopefully they're kind of only remembering the things that are important, but they could also just be forgetting things that are important. Uh, okay, so we were talking about the cross-scan module, and then uh, they also are going to be, lucky for us, they're going to be comparing on Coco, they're going to be comparing on ADE20K, and they're going to be comparing on ImageNet 1K. So we got very lucky that both of these papers are using the same benchmarks. So sometimes, like, you read papers like this, and they don't even use the same benchmark, so you can't even compare it. But lucky for us, they're both using the same three benchmarks, so we will be able to directly compare them. Uh, why don't we take a look at those benchmarks right now? So here is image net classification. Uh, in a classification data set, such as ImageNet, the, you have 14 million annotated images according to the WordNet hierarchy. So the ImageNet uh, is a classification problem. So the annotation here is basically something like dog or cat or tree or car, right? You have a limited set of classes right, or categories, and then your task is to basically consume that image and then say, okay, here's the uh, visual representation of that image, some vector that represents that, and can I classify that into whichever one of the 1,000 categories there is. This is probably the most common benchmark that you see, and I actually really like this website. This website's called Papers with Code, but one of the coolest features that they have is basically these uh, 
leaderboards and you can see here this is the years so down here 2016 all the way to 2023 and you can see all the different papers and the benchmarks that they got so right now the current best uh, ImageNet classification is this one here noisy VITB which is obviously some kind of vision transformer but ImageNet classification has lived its lived out its kind of purpose a little bit like it's really not that good of a benchmark anymore because like the the representational capacity of the models now is so good that they're kind of overfitting a little bit so this noisy vit might not necessarily be uh the best vision backbone that you can get it's probably just in this paper they just figured out some way to basically overfit add more inductive biases so that it gets the highest possible score on uh imagenet but that's imagenet and that's going to be the classification benchmark the object detention benchmark that they're going to use is called COCO. This is Common Objects in Context, I think. And this comes from Microsoft. Microsoft Common Objects in Context. It's a large-scale object detection, segmentation, key point detection, and captioning data set. I think really we're only going to care about this object detection part, which is basically uh, finding the bounding boxes for specific elements within the images themselves. Uh, the data set consists of 328k images, and you can see here over time how we've been improving. So all the way from 2016, you had a fast RCNN at a score of 20, to now you have this co deter getting a score of basically, what is this? 66. So that's how much progress we've made on the COCO benchmark. This is still difficult enough that it, I think it's a good benchmark. And then the last benchmark that both of these papers use is a semantic segmentation benchmark called ADE20K. In a segmentation task, you're basically uh, tracing out your, this is, you're finding the exact, this is usually called a dense uh, task in that you have to basically pick a class. You're, you're basically classifying into a set of uh, categories and classes, but for every single pixel. So you see here how basically every single pixel in this image you have to tell me whether it's part of whether it's the sky whether it's the tree whether it's the road or whatever it is right so it's a dense segmentation task dense task semantic segmentation uh, contains more than 20k scene centric images exhaustively annotated with pixel level object and object part labels there are totally a hundred there are in total 150 different categories which includes stuffs like sky road grass and so on okay so those are the three benchmarks that they're going to be using in both of these papers, AD20K, COCO, and uh, ImageNet 1K. Pretty cool. So uh, let's go over here. Performance comparison on ImageNet 1K. So figure one, generally papers are going to hit you with their kind of their coolest figure right off the bat. So if they hit you with that kind of uh, benchmark, that's usually because they're proud of their results. Let's see if we can get uh, FPS. This is not ImageNet 1K. They don't, I don't think they have an ImageNet score in this one. No, they just have tables. Why don't we look at maybe here? No, let's look at the tables. So we'll look at the table in this first one too. Or maybe we'll look at this graph. Performance comparison of ImageNet 1K. VMamba achieves superior top one accuracy compared to popular counterparts. Top one accuracy basically means that you're very stringent and you're uh, only, you have to get it right, right? So an ImageNet classification problem, sometimes you see what's called top five accuracy. In top five accuracy, you're uh, looking at the five best guesses. And then if the correct answer is in the five best guesses, then it counts as correct right but top one accuracy means it needs to be perfect you need to guess the exact category correctly right and in ImageNet this can get complicated because there's there's kind of like weird categories in ImageNet there's like for example there's a bunch of different breeds of dogs so you don't just need to guess dog you need to guess the exact breed of dog so top one accuracy on ImageNet 1k is like a little bit sketch but they had to kind of pick the the best thing for their paper to show some kind of awesome figure here so they kind of picked top one but I don't know I, I feel like it's a little sketchy we note that the proposed vmamba has the capability of showing global receptive field ERF effective refe receptive field right which is basically how much of the how much of the image is actually a higher level part of this model actually kind of capable of pulling information from right so we know that vision transformers have global receptive field Confnets do not. They all have a limited receptive field. And then uh, here they're calling it effective receptive field, which is like 
kind of what it is in practice. Uh, v Mamba, here we go. Linear complexity, global ERF, dynamic weights, and hats off to the authors of this paper. This is kind of the coolest thing I've ever seen, but look at this. Rather than using check marks and X's, they use little square root signs. <laughs> And then the X's are like kind of the the multiply sign. So they get plus one points for that. Uh, why don't we scroll down to the actual performance charts? Here we go. ImageNet 1K accuracy. So VMamba, they come in three different sizes, right? This is model parameters. So everything from 22 million parameters to 75 million parameters, which is... Uh, quite small. You need so, for example, here the Vision Transformer base with a patch size of 16 has 86 million parameters compared to 307 million parameters. Uh, you can see here accuracy of 83 compared to an accuracy of 76. So looking pretty good. And let's look at the other paper here. This is uh, ImageNet 1K. So do these numbers at least match? So VIT L16 with 384, 307 million parameters, 76. Is that the same? 307, 76. Okay, so at least at least that number's correct, right? Sometimes those numbers don't even match, which means they're pulling their benchmark uh, scores from potentially different places, which is not a good sign, but the VITL matches on both of them. And then what do we have here? VIMS, which I guess is probably the larger one. Yeah, 26 million is at a score of 80. So 80... ImageNet accuracy, 26 million parameters. That's probably comparable to this one, you have 82. So VMamba is better. Cut to the chase, VMamba gets a better score for less parameters, right? At the same image size. And they also train a bigger one here too. So they have a VMamba big that gets 83. So Battle of the Mambas. So far, uh, this Mamba, which is the V Mamba, is winning because one, they have the little square root sign, so that's a plus one, and they get uh, top one image net accuracy is a little bit higher for the same uh, size of parameter. So, so far, 2 0. But uh, let's look at how they do on this uh, s object detection. Object detection and instant segmentation on Coco dataset. You can do instant segmentation on Coco or you could do object detection. Coco has a variety of different tasks that you can perform on that benchmark. Let's see. These are different schedules, so let's. we're probably going to have to compare. Semantic segmentation on ADE 20K. Do they have Coco results? Results of object detection, instant segmentation using mask RC. Okay, this is it. You have VimTI, AP box, so 50, 75, that's kind of like how much overlap for the box to count, right? In object detection, you're basically guessing this little bounding box, and uh, the bounding box is going to have some overlap with the ground truth bounding box. So uh, AP box 75 versus 50, right? 50 means there only needs to be like a slight overlap for you to count that as a, as a correct detection, and the higher this number is, it basically means the more... Uh, stringent you are on that amount of overlap. So what are we at? We're at 4539 for the Vim TI and then if we go here the Vmamba T we're at 46 and then the mask is 42. So let's swap between these 46, 42 and then here we have 45, 39. So so far, VMamba is beating uh, Vim. And then the last benchmark that we're going to look at is the ADE20K, which is the segmentation, semantic segmentation on ADE20K. And what do we got for this one? We got VimTI, 13 million parameters at a um, intersection over union. This is mean intersection over union of 40. And then let's go to the first paper here. Where is their semantic segmentation? Semantic segmentation on S AD 20K. We have VMamba. This is a bigger image resolution, though. You see, this is the problem. 224 image size versus here, you have a much bigger image size. So it's not directly compar comparable, unfortunately. It's also a bigger number of parameters. So you get 47, 48 compared to 
here, 40, so it's a higher number, but 512, 46 million, 44, compared to 500, I guess it is the same image resolution, never mind, I, I just got confused, 512, 555 million parameters, and then 47. Okay, so basically they get beat every time. Okay. All right, so there it is, guys. Uh, actually, here, why don't now that we've compared them and come to the conclusion that VMAMBA is better than VIM, let's look at this effective receptive field, which again is this concept of like, what what are the higher levels of your uh, hierarchy, right? As you in any kind of learning system, you're basically stacking these uh, little blocks, either transformer blocks or convolutional uh, layers or uh, I think they call these Mamba blocks or something like that. But as you get higher and higher in this hierarchy, basically those higher levels have a limited uh, field, receptive field from which they can pull information. So here they're comparing what the re receptive fields look like for different types of models. So they have a ResNet 50. This is just like a fully connected uh, neural net, right? It's just a bunch of layers with uh, residual or skip connections. Then they have a ConvNet. This is a more modern ConvNet, but uh, it's still a ConvNet. You have uh, two types of transformers. You have Swin Transformer and you have the DIT. The Swin Transformer has a little bit of a little bit of a uniqueness. It basically has a uh, limited field. So the Swin Transformer comes from this paper, and it has this shifted window, which brings greater efficiency by limiting self-attention to non-overlapping local windows. So. Swin Transformer was another attempt to basically get rid of this quadratic complexity that comes with transformers by limiting basically the uh, the the receptive field, right? You're kind of limiting the compute computation to, in this case, just these little kind of square uh, patches. So that's why if we actually go back to this, you see that the, for example, the DEIT, which is kind of a more classic global receptive kind of vision transformer, the center pixel basically pays attention to everything. You see that, how it's basically equally paying attention to every single other possible pixel, right? This is before training and after training. So before training, this will give you an idea of the like kind of raw inductive bias, right? So the the bias of the architecture itself before, and before you do any training, but after training shows you how uh, you're gonna be uh, kind of learning better and better uh, representation so the 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 inductive bias might get like kind of moved in some direction or changed right and that's what you're seeing here that's not the same uh, effective receptive field just with the raw arch raw model architecture untrained versus trained so you can see here how the DITS it might be kind of hard to see but the the the, the pixels that are a little bit closer to this are a little bit more dark green I don't, I don't know if that's uh, noticeable or not but basically before training every single pixel is treated equally right the lack of inductive bias that makes transformers so strong and then after training you get a little bit more uh, pay, it's paying a little bit more attention to the things that are close right so it's, it's where the position embeddings are probably being used to kind of amplify the information that's close to it the swin transformer has this weird uh, uh, shifted window crap so you see you see you see like artifacts of that right you see how like there's weird boundaries where like if you happen to be if there happens to be something that like goes in between these edges it can it can get it can produce artifacts right because let's say you had a like in this image you had a dog that was like this it would really only pay attention to the, like the lower lower part of the lower right corner of the dog more so than the upper right corner of the dog so that's kind of one of the problems with this swin transformer that like you get these weird like straightish lines the convnet has this global receptive field or not global local receptive field right so this is the the problem with the convnets right where basically the inductive bias of the convnet basically forces it to pay attention to only the stuff that's kind of close to it you see that where it kind of fuzzes out resnet 50 this is just a fully connected just whole bunch of little neurons so you can see how that has a, a much kind of stronger kind of local receptive field effect uh, what else and then the vmamba which is this paper you can see it has this weird like square right so why does it have this cross right they uh, and 
the reason it has this cross is because I think of this. This is the reason why it has this cross. Because as you're in this cross scan module, right, as you're kind of going in the four different directions that they do, where it's like left to right, top to down, down to top, right to left, you're accumulating this state space, right? You're doing this 1D conv along this in this direction, which means that the state space is is remembering the, the patches that are basically closer more, right? So this patch, there's gonna be more information from this patch in the hidden state than there is from this patch, than there is from this patch, than there is from this patch. So I think the fact that you have basically this, uh, these four different scan directions is the reason why you get this uh, effective receptive field that kind of looks like a cross. And I don't necessarily think this is a good thing, you know? Like this is, to me, this kind of feels a little bit like the Swin Transformer where like you you get weird, like I don't like the fact that there's kind of hard-coded, weird, effective receptive fields here, right? I feel like that probably, if anything, makes the performance worse and makes your... Uh, adds a type of bias that's not great for learning a strong vision uh, representation, but that's what it is. The reason that it seems weaker is that it's uh, faster than V-Mamba. Yeah, so Eclipse pointed out uh, nicely that even though we went to all these tables and we discovered that VIM is worse than VMamba on these benchmarks, but that's also because these guys are basically doing the four different scan directions versus this paper is only doing two different scan directions, right? They only do the forward and the backwards. So this paper, the VIM paper, is the Horizon Robotics paper, right? These guys are all about the speed, the right the improved computational memory and efficiency. So they're basically trading off uh, some representational capacity, as is indicative by the fact that they perform a little bit worse on their benchmarks compared to this paper, which is really, uh, it's it's more compute and memory heavy, but it's also going to be slower, right? Because now you have to do this other kind of scan direction as well. So that's a good point. The image size is not the same as vision transformers. Yeah, so vision transformers, right, they're they're quadratic with respect to the input uh, input sequence length or the size of the image. So when you're using a vision transformer, you, you see them with image sizes like 224 by 224 because people basically want to make the image as small as possible to make it uh, faster. But these papers, these Mambas, they're better, they're capable of using bigger image sizes, so they're kind of advertising the bigger image size, right? If you're good at big image sizes because you have this linear complexity, of course you're going to be using big images and say, hey, look how good we are with these big images, right? Uh, okay. So we compared them. Uh, we looked at the effective receptive field. Now let's get, let's dive into it. All right, guys. So both of these papers have a method section and both of these method sections have a preliminary kind of explanation of what a, a, a state space model is, right? So both of these basically have what it, what is trying, both of these little sections here are trying to teach you the same thing. They're trying to explain state space models in the smallest, most compressed amount of tokens possible, right? They don't want to take a whole page of their paper to describe what a state space model is, so these little method sections are pretty good at compressing what you need to know. So why don't we like kind of go through both of them and see if by reading both of them and doing this kind of ensemble, we get a better understanding of what state space models are. Okay, so let's start with this one here. State space models are commonly considered linear time invariant systems that map stimulation XT in RL to response. So this is kind of an interesting way to think about that. Normally you see this as input sequence or prompt to response or answer, but stimulation to response is kind of a weird way to think about it, very sexual way to think about it. Here they call it, for example, a sequence to sequence. So you're mapping some sequence X of T to Y of T. Uh, through a hidden state H. So 
H is this hidden state that's basically going to act as your bottleneck, right? Where you're the hidden state, you're going to limit the amount of information that can get passed from uh, token to token through the sequence. And by doing that, you're going to you're going to basically ensure that you're not spending a huge amount of compute, but then you're also going to be forgetting a bunch of things possibly that uh, could help you. So uh, these models are typically formulated, blah, 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 as linear ordinary differential equations where the parameters include A, B, and C for its state size N with skip connections D. Okay, so you have this formula here. You have your output is equal to your input times some matrix D, right? And then you have this hidden state H, which is multiplied by some matrix C. And then your hidden state H, you can use it to compute the next hidden state H prime. All right, so same thing coming here. You have H, right, is being used for, you can use it to get H prime here with this A and B matrix, and this is the input X, and then this is the output Y with HT. So you see it's basically the same thing. Here they add this D, X of T, and here they use C. So basically the same there. S4 and Mamba are the discrete versions of the continuous system. So this is continuous in that you see this time. You can plug in any time, right? But they want discrete versions where you have some time step, right? So that time step is going to be this delta to transform the continuous parameters into discrete parameters A bar and B bar. The commonly used method for transformation is zero order hold, which is defined as follows. So the exponent of delta A, where delta A is this discretized uh, A, and then if we go to here, discrete state space models as continuous time models face great challenges when integrated into deep learning algorithms. To overcome this obstacle, the discretization pr process becomes imperative. The primary objective of discretization is to transform the ODE into a discrete function. This transformation is crucial to align the model with the sample rate of the underlying signal. The sample rate of the underlying signal is basically the fact that your input signal, right, Y of T, or your input signal S X of T is is discretized into steps, right? So x of t is not a continuous function. It's a speci it's a sequence of tokens, right? So you basically want the model to also operate kind of in this discretized kind of step by step by step by step by step manner. Uh, embodied in the input data, enabling computationally efficient operations. Consider the input x t or x k. Well, I guess k is like the index of where you are in the sequence. A sampled vector within the signal flow of length L, the ODE could be discretized using the following zeroth order hold rule. Okay, so you basically have the discretized version of it here, right? Where H, the hidden state at, at uh, K minus one, you can use that to get the hidden state at K using the output or the input XK, and then XK can be used with the hidden state HK to get the output YK, right? Uh, here you have the exponent again being used on both of these. Exponent A bar equals exponent delta A. Ooh. A bar equals exponent delta A. Uh, dimensionality of C is D by N. Dimensionality of this delta is R by D. In practice, following 12, we refine the approximation of B bar using the first order Taylor series. So here's, I guess, how they get B bar equals delta B. Cool. Do they say something similar here? B bar equals this times delta B. They just, after the discretization step, the discretized version using a step size delta can be rewritten as this. So that's the discretized version that we saw there. This one has this D, right? Like this one has A, B, C, D, but this one only has A, B, C. Oh. I wonder why they're getting rid of that. Why don't they have the extra term there? right? It's kind of weird. Where m is the length of the input sequences x, k bar is a structured convolutional kernel. Diverging from the prevalent approach that predominantly focus on linear time invariant SSMs, the proposed vMamba sets itself apart by incorporating the selective scan mechanism as the core SSM operator. The matrices B, C, and delta are derived from the input data X. This implies that S6 is aware of contextual information embedded in the input, ensuring the dynamism of the weights within the mechanism. I don't know. I, don't, I feel like this dynamism of the weights to me, like they mention it in this paper, right? They say the dynamic weights, but it might not be this paper. I think it's this paper. 
but I don't really think it's there's no like formal definition there, right? They keep saying that like, oh, in a ConvNet you have these like hard coded filters, and then in a uh, arc, uh, transformer model that's not hard coded because you're kind of modifying them. They're more context dependent. But I feel like that distinction isn't as like black and white as they're kind of making it seem. And it's like the dynamism is more like this kind of like subjective quality of like how much the the input sequence can kind of change. The, the behavior of like higher levels of the hierarchy. Okay. I don't know if I lost everybody or not. <laughs> uh, okay, let's go into the next part. So now we've looked at the preliminaries for both of these and then now they're gonna kind of describe the exact uh, details of their particular implementation here. So it's gonna be a little bit different. S6 causally processes the input data and this can only capture information within the scan part of the data. Despite non-causal nature, images differ from text that they contain 2D spatial information. To tackle this problem, SAND, which is a different type of state space uh, vision model, uh, suggests reformulating SSM with convolution and straightforwardly expanding the kernel via outer product. Address this problem, we propose the cross scan module. This is what we saw earlier, right? This kind of like four different directions here four different scan directions. The cross scan module, any pixel such as the center pixel integrates information from all other pixels in different directions. We then reshape each sequence into a single image and all sequences are merged to form a new one as illustrated in figure three. Where's the figure three? Illustration of the 2D selective scan on an image. Okay, so you're gonna have your four different scan directions, right? So this is going left to right, top to down. This is going top to down, left to right, and then you have the other two ones there. So this is your four different scan directions. Each of those four different scan directions is going to go into this, each, each, each one of them will have this S6 block. That is your X, which is now your sequence, right? So you have an input sequence X, which is this thing here, right, of tokens scanned in four different ways. You're going to project them into these matrices B, C, the delta matrix, or the delta, and then the A and D. Do all that math there, all that all that state space math, and you're going to output this Y, which is your, your YK here. And then there you go. Now you've gone from basically sequence to sequence, right? And because you're going to basically stack a bunch of these blocks, right? So you're not just going to do this once. You're going to basically keep doing this. You're going to have a bunch of these blocks all on top of each other. The next block that's here needs to basically consume uh, another 2D kind of thing like this, right? So then you're going to do the same thing. You're going to merge it back into a 2D uh, little image so that you can then do the same scan again, right? And there you go. And then you're going to have a bunch of these S S6 blocks on top of each other. So that's the VSS blocks here, is that, this S6 VSS. And you can see how you have boom, boom, boom. You have a bunch of these blocks in a row here. So for example here, right, very similar to a ConvNet, right, where in a ConvNet, the uh, height and width basically keeps getting smaller and smaller. So you're getting a more and more and more compressed in the height and width and the kind of spatial dimensions. But then the, the, the channel dimension, which is kind of like the, you could think of it like the representation capacity or the depth, right, is going to increase. So here you have an image of HW by three. The three, dimen the three channel dimensions here are just R, G, and B. And then by the time you get here, it's H over 32, W over 32. So it's like almost like a little, like little tiny little thumbnail, right? And then the C4 is gonna be way bigger than three, right? So you're basically increasing the, the kind of like information-y, like representation-y kind of stuff and packing that into this channel dimension. Oh, and actually it's way more than just these. Look at this, you have times two. So you have two of these blocks in a row, nine of these blocks in a row, and then two of these blocks in a row. This is kind of a weird, why did they do two, two, nine, two? Right, doesn't that seem kind of weird? Why? Where did they come up with that? Okay, <laughs> little skip connection here. Huh, all right, let's look at this one. Uh, the overview of the proposed VIM model. We first split the input image into patches and then project them into patch tokens. 
this one does have position embeddings. So this second one does include position embeddings. I don't think this one does at all. Yeah. Partitioning the input image into patches using a stem similar to VITs, but without further flattening the patches into a 1D sequence. I mean, they do flatten it. They just flatten it four ways, like this. They create four different uh, flattened version of the sequences, flattened versions of this 2D image. To perform uh, into the patch, we send the sequence of tokens to the proposed Vim encoder. To perform ImageNet classification, we concatenate an extra learnable classification token to the patch token sequence. So basically, uh, these you see here these patches are being turned into these tokens. Then each of those tokens has uh, associated position embedding, basically a little extra vector. But then they have what is called a class token, which is usually a token that you put at the very beginning. And it's a way for the uh, transformer or any kind of model that is consuming this to basically put information into that. Because the you're always gonna be consuming that first token first, you can kind of use it to basically set the context, right? Like say, here's, kind of effectively like a like a little state that describes the class, which in this case is gonna be like snake, right? So this little star class token is basically gonna contain ideally some kind of like almost like global semantic information of like this is a picture of a snake with some trees and some grass and it has the, the style, trying to like pack all that information into this little star, right? Which is actually similar to uh, the DEIT transformers where you also have a class token here, you have the patch tokens, but then you have a distillation token at the end, right? Okay, let's go back. Uh, Vim encoder processes the tokens with both forward and backward direction, right? So here you have your uh, Vision Mamba encoder, you have an MLP, very similar to the transformer MLP, except here, right, in the other one, you have those four directions. Here, you have two directions. And then you have a separate SSM block for the backward direction and the forward direction, which they actually ablated. So in this paper, they have a nice little ablation study at the very end here, where we ablate the key bidirectional design of Vim using ImageNet 1K. To fully evaluate the power of learned representations, we use a simple segmentation with only two layers. Okay, so what if they only had this forward direction, right? What if they basically keep the same inductive bias that the vision transformers have, and rather than doing it in two directions, this bi-directional stuff, they do it only in one direction. So I think that's a very useful little uh, uh, ablation there, because we can directly compare it to the bi-directional, and then they keep adding more bi-directional block. We pair the stacked blocks. The first block processes in the forward, the second block passes in the backwards. So here they're talking about whether or not they're including uh, these blocks here. So whether or not these are separate and whether or not you have these uh, Comp1D blocks there. Uh, add an extra SSM for each block and then bidirectional SSM plus Comp1D based on bidirectional SSM with the extra Comp1D before the backwards. So with this extra Comp1D and then also separate SSM blocks for each one. And I think, where is the chart for this? Yeah, so look at this. So with no bidirectional uh, inductive bias, 73 versus 32. With the like full Monty, like everything ordered, avocado, bacon on the, like all the stuff, all the fixings. Look at that. <laughs> I don't know about that. That kind of means that like ablation study kind of telling me that it really doesn't fucking matter. <laughs> so this is kind of interesting, right? Where basically on two different benchmarks, ImageNet, the classification benchmark, and then the semantic segmentation benchmark, it seems like this bidirectional doesn't really seem to do much, right? Like they, they basically have separate stacks here. They're basically doubling the compute here because they have to do it both forward and backward. And it doesn't really seem to make a difference, which is a little bit confusing because these guys, they're all about the speed, right? This is the robotics, the autonomous vehicle group. They're trying to make this as fast as possible. So if your ablation study is telling you that you're not really getting that much of a performance boost by uh, doing it either entirely no no forward backward just only forward like a vision transformer that's a little sketch right I don't know I don't know what to think about that what is the point of it then it sounds cool <laughs> yeah. and that's fine you know it's like you want to do the type of science where a no result, like a kind of a, a, re, a bad result is still a good result, right? So like 
I, I like science whenever you're like, hey, I, here's an experiment that I did. I thought this was going to matter and then it ended up not mattering, right? Like that is still useful because it means that people can now use that and in their experiments not have to do this bi-directional stuff, right? People don't necessarily do that. A lot of times when people write papers, they'll do a lot of extra experiments, but if the experiments don't work, they don't mention it. Right? They basically, oh, we tried to do this thing and it didn't work. Well, if it didn't work, don't even mention it in the paper and only mention the things that work in this paper, in the paper, right? Because you want the paper to only have all the cool stuff. But I think that does a disservice to the community as a whole because you kind of want to say, hey, here's all the tricks that we tried to do and here are the ones that actually work. So I don't know. I'm perfectly okay with this. I think it's interesting to me that they basically said, hey, we achieved similar classification, exceptional segmentation superiority. I don't is that really that much fucking better? 34 versus 32? That doesn't seem that much better either, right? 34 means it's like roughly here versus 32. That's almost nothing, right? Like exceptional semantic segmentation score on 80, 20K would be if you had like a score of 48 versus a score of 63. But what are we talking about here? You're talking about... <laughs> 34 versus 32 that doesn't really seem that exceptional but I don't know like I said at least it's interesting to me because it tells me that unidirectional versus bidirectional doesn't really matter so maybe this shit that they're doing here in this paper with the like four different directions maybe you don't need to do that and you can save yourself a bunch of compute by not having to do that the point was to get Hoopo to make a stream on it yeah, I don't know any of these guys, you know. Sometimes I cringe because I worry that, like, you know, like, I review papers on my channel, so, like, it's almost inevitable that I end up, like, talking shit on some of these papers. But I always, like, cringe and worry about, like, whether some of these random people will, like, one day watch a stream and then they'll they'll hear me shit on their paper and they'll be like, wow, what an asshole. Like, that guy just talks shit on my paper and I just, you know, I don't, I don't mean my criticism... You know, I don't really mean it. I support all these people and their dreams, and I want everybody in the machine learning space to succeed, but I just can't help it to to be critical of papers, you know. But I wish all these people the best. Uh, where were we? I think we were here. Yeah, we were looking at this block. Okay, the structure of the VSS block is illustrated in figure 4B. So 4B here. This is the VSS block. So the VSS block undergoes an initial linear embedding layer. That's this little linear here, right? You're basically just a little linear layer of little neurons. Uh, the output splits into two information flows. One flow passes through a three, three by three depth-wise convolutional kernel. So the depth-wise means that it's uh, convolving in this channel dimension, right? Uh, followed by a silu activation function. So a silu activation function is kind of similar to a ReLU. So ReLU is the one that kind of everybody's familiar with. It's that rectified linear, so it's just completely flat and then completely flat here, linear, right? Silu has this little bit, it's almost like a leaky ReLU, but like a kind of cooler version of the leaky ReLU because you're using this this uh, sigmoid, right? But you basically have the, inf the ability for a little bit of kind of negative signal to leak through, right? That's the advantage of things like the leaky ReLU and the, and the Silu and, and things like that is that you don't just zero out the negative stuff. You basically have a little bit, you, you kind of let the, the negative stuff leak a little bit, right? So, which is more uh, what you see in, in the real world, right? Like if you actually think about your brain, right? Whenever your, your brain doesn't really do back propagation, but there is this notion of kind of uh, uh, inhibitory action in your brain, right? Where basically neurons that are further along in the chain can kind of inhibit the activation and like almost like prevent the neuron ahead of them from firing again later, right? So... I don't know. I feel like Silu, Leaky ReLU are probably a little bit more similar to what's happening in the brain, even though the brain isn't doing back propagation. So maybe this whole analogy is a moot point. Uh, before entering the core SS2D module, the output of the SS2D goes through a layer normalization layer. So layer normalization here, you're basically normalizing all the stuff in that layer so that it's all nicely shaped, right? You don't want big numbers. You don't want very small numbers. 
and then is added to the output of the other information flow, with, which has also undergone a silu activation. This is silu, silu, relu, silu, something like that. This combination produces the final output of the VSS block. Unlike vision transformers, we refrain from utilizing position embedding bias in vMamba due to its causal nature. So this is what I was trying to get to before, where this paper here, they don't have any position basically encoding. They don't have additional position information that is being added to each of these little uh, patch uh, patches, right? Which is different from in this paper where they do do that. In this paper, they do have extra patch to, or extra position embedding information there. And they also have the class token. So this one does not have that. No class token, no, uh, no position information. Uh, our design diverges from the typical vision transformer, which employs the following sequence of operations, norm, attention, norm, MLP in a block. So here they're referring to in a vision transformer, you have the attention mechanism. Here are your norms, normalizations. And then you also have this MLP, it's multi-layer perceptron. This paper does not have that. Discard the MLP. So the VSS block is shallower than the VIT block. What they're saying by shallower, it, does, it just doesn't have this norm part. It doesn't have this. It's basically just a bunch of these, like kind of like uh, SS2M blocks, I think they're calling them, or VSS blocks. Terminology is kind of getting a little confusing, but they basically only have this here, which means that it's shallower, aka there's less depth to it, if you think about the depth through the hierarchy. But their justification is that you can basically stack more of them with a similar budget. It's different from this one. This one does have an MLP. So you see here, this one here, after you go through their Mamba block or little Mamba encoder, whatever they want to call it, they do have an MLP there. So a couple different uh, approaches here. Uh, and then we get to the experiment section, which we kind of saw earlier in the stream where we were basically comparing the numbers. I don't think there's anything necessarily worth talking about that there. We talked about this. This was pretty cool. The receptive field. Again, I feel like it's kind of weird. Like, I don't like this cross activation. Like, that fucking... This gives me the heebie-jeebies. I don't know why. Uh, here you have the performance for different image resolution. So you can see, obviously, image resolution being equivalent to the sequence length. You can see how the transformer variants, such as DEIT, explode. Look at that quadratic complexity. The SWIN transformers are a little bit more uh, efficient because they have that, they're limiting it to that specific window, right? So you see they don't quite explode as bad as the DEITs. And then the ConvNets uh, have the same kind of linear complexity as the Mambas. But you can see here, that's really the advantage is the speed at higher resolutions. Uh, efficiency analysis, yeah. So in this paper, this is the Horizon Robotics, the Vision Mamba paper. They do have this cool little section here, which a little bit, it's a little bit intense, you know. I'll, I'll admit myself that I don't really fully understand exactly what they're doing here, but I thought it was kind of interesting because a lot of papers just kind of think about RAM versus VRAM, right? Like the RAM on your computer versus the VRAM, but there's like levels beyond that, right? Even within your GPU, there's levels of memory. There's different caches, right? So you have high bandwidth memory and SRAM are two important components for GPU. The SRAM has a larger bandwidth, which means it can send, it can receive and send uh, information more. And then HBM has a bigger memory size, which means it's like a bigger pool. You can fit, you can put more numbers in there. Okay, so you have two different memory caches within a GPU that have slightly different benefits and negatives. So the implementation of VIMS SSM requires the number of memory IO on the order of O, B, M, E, N. So here, this is a uh, big O notation. And here, the B, M, E, N are basically four different things here. E is the dimension of the uh, state, the expanded state. N is the uh, SSM dimension. B is the, I think, batch size. I don't know exactly where they, I think they say it here, yeah. Uh, token sequence B, so B is the batch size and then M is the length of the sequence. So you multiply all four of those numbers and there you go, the the, uh, the complexity is that. Vim first reads in B, M, E plus E, N, so this is better. 
right? So even though this uh, this is better because here you have a multiplication between BME and N, and here you just have a multiplication between BME and then plus EN. So this is better in terms of big O notation complexity. Bytes of memory from slow HBM to fast HRAM, SRAM. Then VIM gets the discrete a not bar and B not bar with a size of B, M, E, N, and SRAM. Last, Vim performs SSM operations in SRAM and writes the output of a size B, M, E back to HBM. This method can help reduce IOs from B, M, E, N to O, B, M, E plus E, N. So this is like some fucking... It always impresses me when people can just like think about this shit like that, right? So for example... To calculate the gradient, Vim recomputes them at the network backward pass for intermediate activations. Vim also recomputes them to optimize the GPU memory requirement. So the way that they design this, they recompute certain things so that you don't have to basically uh, uh, deal with a specific part of the GPU memory that has a uh, slower bandwidth, which is like, damn, you know, like who the hell like actually like can come up with these ideas uh, SSM in a VIM block and self attention both play a key role in providing global context adaptively given a visual sequence which is a sequence of patches and the default setting the computational complexity of a global self attention and SSM so this is the uh, kind of like a big O notation but it's basically the complexity of self attention you can see this m squared so the length of the input sequence squared so the dominant term here is going to be this m squared right so the bigger your image it's going to keep squaring so this is why this is way worse than this you see here the complexity of the state space model there's no m squared there it's n squared in terms of m squared in terms of this n dimension here but that number is going to be way smaller than this m the computational efficiency makes Vim scalable for gigapixel applications with large sequence length. Which I thought was interesting, you know? I think that when you're dealing with autonomous vehicles, right, you can't really make the image smaller because one of the problems with autonomous vehicles is that things are very far away, right? So, like, y you have a picture, and it's like what your car is seeing, but if you're driving on a highway, right, the car in front of you might be a very, very small little tiny car because it's just, it, it's very, it's far away from you. It's like, it's like 50 meters ahead of you, but 50 meters ahead of you is only a couple seconds at the speed that you're going, right? So one of the hard parts about autonomous vehicles is that, is that you, you can't really reduce the size of the image because you have to be careful because some of the stuff that's very important, such as the car in front of you or a road sign or something like that, might actually just be a very, very tiny little patch of pixels, right? So in autonomous vehicle applications, being able to basically use full-size images at a very high speed and with a efficient uh, compute and memory is much more useful than uh, if you're doing some kind of application like a vision language model for a like an assistant, right? Like if you're just taking a picture of your food and asking how many calories are there, it, you can compress the image, right? It's like largely, it just needs to know whether you're eating Twinkies or whether you're eating like salad, right? Which is, you can, you can lose some information there and still kind of provide a good uh, response. But for something like autonomous vehicles, you need to maintain that image size because if you get rid of that, if you make the image smaller, you might miss the sign, the stop sign that's 100 meters away and it's just a little tiny little square inside your image, a little tiny patch of uh, pixels. So, I don't know, maybe that's kind of where this all goes. Maybe you see uh, these Mamba models in the vision really only in very time sensitive and edge computing applications but you never really see them kind of gain traction in the more generic uses like uh, visual assistance. But I don't know, I'm just trying to to say some things there. Cross makes me concerned about the Janus issue. Is there any going to be performance worse on images with a normal composition? Yeah. And I don't, they don't mention it, but this is kind of like, so one of the reasons that convnets work so well is that they have this kind of 
2D translation invariant uh, inductive bias, right? Where basically, no matter where in the picture the dog is, the ConvNet can basically detect it roughly equally, right? And that's one of the reasons that ConvNets became so popular. So the part of the problem with that though is that if your images are rotating, right, like then your your feature maps are not rotating. They're always kind of like the same, right? So you're you're spending a bunch of your kind of capacity storing different feature maps for basically what is the same feature. Like if you think about this, look at this. This this and this are basically the same thing, right? It's just that one of them is slightly rotated and you have to do that because your images might have the dog might be rotated relative to the x and y axes of your image so you're kind of spending a bunch of your model capacity kind of s storing the same feature map just rotated versions of the same uh kernels that you're going to convolve around that so i wonder if there's kind of like a, a similar situation here where you're kind of introducing this inductive bias for things that are kind of like vertically and, and horizontally kind of like aligned like that and like if you rotate the snake, right, like, I don't know. I don't know exactly what I'm trying to, to describe there, right? I'm trying to basically, like, describe a black box system. You know, like, at the end of the day, these learned uh, representations that you get in any of these models here, like ResNets, ConvNets, Transformers, Mambas, so, like, it's very hard to interpret what exactly they mean as a human. But, I don't know. I, I feel like there's there's just set something going on with that, with that cross. Vmamba activates all pixels and notably emphasizes the cross-shaped activations. The cross-scan scanning mechanism ensures the central pixel is most influenced by pixels along the cross, prioritizing long dependency context over local information for each pixel. Intriguingly, Vmamba exhibits only a local ERF at before training. However, after training transforms the ERF to global. So here the ERF is the receptive field. So here they're saying the receptive field before training, which is kind of like you could think of it like the raw unadulterated bias of the architecture itself is local versus once you actually train it uh it becomes this more global receptive field you can also see how the the green color here is darker which means that uh it's pain like it, it can pay attention to the more global information compared to here it's like basically zero outside uh signifying an adaptive process in the model's global capacity. So here they're trying to kind of paint it as a good picture and saying that, hey, by being the one that can change the most, it has the most ability to kind of flex and adopt the receptive field that is the most useful for producing good visual representations, right? If the if this effective receptive field was the same before and after training, it means that the architecture is basically very, very uh, stringent and basically forces that receptive field regardless of whether or not it's actually useful for learning visual representations but they're saying that by being uh very by by this being different from this it's basically telling you that vmamba has the ability to to kind of to massage that inductive bias and make it more global if that just happens to be the the the, the way to get the best visual representation it's more adaptive we believe that this adaptive process continues to the model's enhanced perception of images. This stands in contrast to DEIT, which maintains nearly identical ERFs at before and after training. So here they're saying that your standard transformer just pays attention to everything no matter what, right? This paper has, I think, the, the better image to show that, right? How in a traditional vision transformer, you basically, every single patch can affect every other patch. So if you're looking at this patch, you basically have to account for every other patch versus here, you only have this state uh, that's been kind of accumulating in four different directions and then you basically have uh, the state from each of the four directions coming in. What else? I think I'm kind of running out. Why don't we read the conclusions here and then we'll go back, answer some questions and then maybe summarize. Okay, so we're going to pull up both of the conclusions. Let's come here. Conclusion and future work. We have proposed Vision Mamba to explore the very recent efficient state space models, i.e. Mambas, as generic vision backbones. Unlike prior state space models for vision tasks, which use hybrid architectures or equivalent global 2D convolutional kernel, Vim learns visual representations in the sequence modeling manner and does not introduce image-specific inductive biases. So, 
does it? I don't know. <laughs> Thanks to a proposed bidirectional state-based modeling, Vim achieves data-dependent global visual context and enjoys the same modeling power as transformers. Again, I don't know if that's necessarily true, while having lower computational complexity. That is definitely true. Betting fitting from the hardware-aware designs of Mamba, which is here they're referencing that fucking black magic they did with the different GPU memory, right? And recomputing things instead of uh, storing them. The inference speed and memory usage of Vim are significantly better than VITs when processing high-resolution images, which is useful in uh, autonomous vehicles where you want to be able to basically detect things that are very small. Experiments result on standard computer vision benchmarks have verified the model's power and high efficiency, showing that Vim has a great potential to be the next generation vision backbone. Like I said, I feel like it's probably not going to usurp Transformers, right? It's like not, the results here aren't good enough to usurp the Transformers, but I think if you're doing some kind of edge application or latency sensitive application, maybe people will use these. Uh, in future works, Vim with the bidirectional SSM modeling with position embeddings is suitable for unsupervised tasks such as mask image modeling, masked image modeling. I think this is supposed to be masked, not mask. Masked image modeling pre-training is the basically that kind of like self-supervised -super, self task where you're basically uh, masking out or basically zeroing out different little patches and then getting it to reconstruct those patches. So it's a, it's a kind of a pre-training objective to train these things from scratch. But if I were training these, I wouldn't train these from scratch. I would try to distill an already existing uh, vision encoder, such as the uh, Dino one, for example. Uh, Mamba enables multimodal tasks, such as clip-style pre-training. Uh, based on the pre-trained Vim weights, exploring the usefulness of Vim for analyzing high-resolution medical images, remote sensing images, and long videos. So high-resolution medical images, another application similar to autonomous vehicles where uh, using the, the, the kind of larger image size is important, right? You don't want to have to uh, resize it to 224 in order to detect cancer. It's like you kind of want the, the full resolution of the medical image. Remote sensing images, long videos, which can be regarded as downstream tasks, is very straightforward. There's the, the reference to videos, which is, I think one of you mentioned that. Okay, that's the conclusion of Vision Mamba. Let's get to the conclusion of V Mamba. This is the V Mamba. So V Mamba, convolutional neural networks and vision transformers represent the predominant foundation models for visual representation learning. Again, I would say that vision transformers are much more popular than CNNs nowadays. While CNNs exhibit linear complexity with respect to image resolution, VITs excel in fitting capability despite quadratic complexity. So VITs give you better representations. Our investigation reveals that VITs achieve superior visual modeling through global receptive fields. That's part of it, you know, but it's not all of it. And then the dynamic weights, I feel like that's, as I said, that kind of seems more subjective than an actual like kind of like formal uh, thing to me. Motivated by this, we propose the visual state-space model, VMAMBA, drawing inspiration from the state-space model to achieve linear complexity without sacrificing global receptive fields. To address direction sensitivity, right, this left to right top down bias, we introduced this cross scan module for spatial traversal, converting non-causal visual images into ordered patch sequences. Extensive experiments demonstrate VMAMBA's promising performance across visual tasks with pronounced advantages as image resolution increases, surpassing established benchmarks. That's it guys, that's, that's it. Let me take a sip of this coffee. If you guys have any questions, feel free to ask them now and then we'll summarize what we just went through and we'll give you guys your time back. Where do I work or am I a student? I'm no longer a student. Um, it's been a while, but I learn every day. I don't have a formal job. I, I just kind of do consulting and contracting. If you have cool, interesting stuff that you want, that you're okay paying an exorbitant amount of money for, like feel free to reach out. I have my email somewhere. I have like a business email that you guys can reach out. But, you know, I don't quite have fuck you money, but I have enough money that I can kind of pick and choose the cool projects. Can you explain the cross again and how it compares to self-attention 
Yeah, so the cross pattern, basically, let's see, this one has here. So in both of these papers, they constantly talk about this idea of a global receptive field. And what they're talking about there is that in a transformer, right, you have, let me pull out a self-attention, tension, uh, mechanism, vision, transformer. I want the like kind of square image because I think it'll be better for describing what I'm talking about. Okay, none of these are what I want. Let me let me just do self attention mechanism. Dude, why the fuck am I not? Uh, attention map transformer. Uh, yeah, okay. Here's a, I guess this is kind of the best I'm going to get. So, in an attention, in a vision transformer like this, right, you basically have this multi head attention here. And what this multi head attention is doing is it's allowing every single patch in this sequence to basically pay attention to any other patch in the sequence and pay attention to, you can think of it like it's basically doing a, a like a dot product and then some other stuff after that. But basically you can think of, think of all the numbers here. Basically you see this 88052, 88052. You see how every single, there's a square for every single combination. There's how much is zero paying attention to one. And then there's also how much zero is paying attention to one. So it's like, basically you have this quadratic or square, right? Quadratic comes from the word for square, quadrado which means square in Spanish is Latin, right? So everything can pay attention to everything, right? And the the picture here shows it as well, right? So this patch here, right, has a global receptive field in that every single other patch can influence it directly, right? And what that looks like is it looks like this, right? It basically means that a transformer here represented by a DITS, where S is the small size, this little square basically is has there's no inductive bias and it kind of equally pays attention to pretty much every single other pixel right every single other patch right and even after training it's still basically paying attention to pretty much every single other square equally right maybe a little bit more for the ones there but this vmamba s right does not do that right this little patch here only pays attention to the patch before it and then a hidden state which basically uh, aggregates information from the patch ahead of it, right? So if we go to the actual equations here, right, this patch here is only looking at the previous patch, right, the XK, the one before it, but it's also looking at this hidden state. So it's kind of like accumulating this hidden state as it, as it uh, does this 1D conv across this. And then what that means is that the information kind of in the, in the, in the patches that are kind of right before it and right after it or right above it or right below it have a little bit more impact on that hidden state and they also have more impact on the patch itself. So what ends up happening is that basically the stuff that is horizontal and vertically above that pixel has more of an influence than the stuff around it. And like the way to look at this is that uh, whereas the transformer pays equal attention to everything, the Vmamba pays, only, pays more attention to, for example, this thing here than this thing here. Even though this this little group of pixels here is literally closer to the pixel of interest, it it's still paying more attention to the pixels here. And that's kind of why I don't necessarily like it because I think that like, why in, kind of just in your head at a high level, it seems like you should want something more like this, right? You should be able to, you should be paying more attention to your local neighborhood of pixels rather than kind of pixels that are far away, but just happen to be vertically aligned with you and horizontally aligned with you. But even doubly weird is that uh, that's not even the, the true kind of inductive bias that you have just from the architecture itself. It should actually just be like this, right? But it's only after training that you get this, which means that the model itself over time learned to basically have this kind of attention pattern. I, I use attention, but it's not actually doing attention, right? I guess I'm just overloading that term attention. You finally turned off this NVIDIA eye thing? No, I turned it back on. It used to be off for a while. You look at that, guys. Let's see if I can get it. Oh, you see that? <laughs> 
Kalina, Stalin. So the hope is that the hidden state contains the information that we aren't looking at directly. Yeah, the hidden state, you can think of the hidden state basically kind of like a hidden state in a, in a recurrent neural network, right? Recurrent neural networks have, or LSTMs, also have this same kind of idea of like basically you you accumulate this kind of hidden state that, that you're packing all the information into, right? So the benefit of that is that the hidden state is always the same size, right? So no matter what, no matter, even if you had an image size that was 10 million, si 10 million times bigger, right? Imagine an image that was huge and it basically you, you went and you scanned the entire image. That's a, a much larger input sequence length, but it doesn't matter because you only care about that little hidden state. So you can basically, f that hidden state size freezes it and is independent of the length of the sequence beforehand, right? But... And that makes it uh, linear complexity, which is why it's faster. But the problem with that is that now you're you're trying to fit a bunch of information into the size of that little hidden state, right? So it could be that if you try to fit too much shit in there, eventually it starts forgetting shit, right? So it's the same problem that you have with RNNs and LSTMs, where basically you start usually you forget the stuff that's further away in time, right? So like as you keep uh, uh, propagating this little hidden state forward and forward and forward, step by step by step by step. Usually the shit long time ago is the stuff that gets forgotten. And then the stuff that you just went through is the stuff that gets remembered, right? LSTMs tried to fix this by having this like long-term, short-term, like kind of like fancy little gates that like kind of do that. But like, it's still, it still is an issue. And they're also more annoying to train because now you have to have this hidden state. You have to basically build up this hidden state to actually end up pushing a gradient. But the hidden state, it's all about the hidden state. Okay. Uh, let's summarize. So today we reviewed, uh, or we performed a battle. We did a head-to-head -head battle between two different vision mambas. So a mamba is a snake that is very fast, and a mamba is the name that has been given to basically what are called state space models, which are a model architecture that tries to answer uh, the issue or tries to solve the issue of uh, transformers. The main issue with transformers is that they have basically a global receptive field. They have very little inductive biases, but it also means that they're quadratic when it comes to the uh, complexity relative to the input sequence. So they basically work very bad with very big images and they're quite slow. The bigger the image, the worse the VIT performs in terms of memory and speed. So there's a lot of different ways that people have tried to basically constrain the size or the stride of the computing window, right? So like reduce that quadratic complexity and state-based models are one way of doing that. So these two papers basically got released almost on the same day from two different groups. One one of the groups, both of these are Chinese groups, uh, UCAS, Pengchen, Huawei, and then you have Huazhong, Beijing Academy of Artificial Intelligence, and Horizon Robotics. So as far as I know, these are separate groups. I don't know how much kind of like cross work there is between them. I'm not like super familiar with Chinese academic institutions. It could be the case that both of these are more together than I think they are, but uh, they both have slightly different implementations of this. So I think the best way is to just look at the picture. I think the main difference between both of these papers is that the uh, Vision Mamba paper basically uh, does a forward and a backward direction to try to get rid of that uh, transformer inductive bias that you get from flattening an image into patches and then consuming it as a sequence, right? There's this kind of like inductive bias that you get where here you because you flatten the image into patches and treat that as a sequence you're introducing a weird bias there right you're basically saying why there's there's these kind of like disconnects there one way you can try to fix that is by adding position embeddings which this paper adds but this paper uh, mainly solves it by doing a forward and a backward right so backward goes uh, right to left and then bottom to top and then the forward here goes uh, left to right and then top to down the, this paper here does it differently. They do it with what, what they call a cross-scan module, and the cross-scan module basically goes in uh, four different directions. So it goes, you see the same left to, left to right, top to down, and then the same bottom to up, right to left, but then they also do it kind of horizontally, so kind of like a weird top-down, 
left to right and then bottom up right to left so this has less of a kind of uh, scan bias if you want to call it that way than this one and because of that they also don't have position embedding so this model here does not include uh, position embeddings with each of these patches whereas this one does this one also has a class token but as we discovered they did an ablation study in this one and they ablated whether or not you need only the forward direction versus the forward and the backward direction right we further add the backward blah 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 and it actually turned out that it doesn't really matter so you see here none so just standard transformer vision transformer bias of just left to right top down you almost get the same accuracy in ImageNet and AD20K as you do with the full bidirectional and the extra conv 1D block before that so kind of a weird situation there it basically means to me it means that the the position embeddings are basically stronger than then because you're adding these position embeddings it doesn't matter that you do the forward and the backward that's kind of I don't know my hypothesis there I think if they would have gotten rid of these position embeddings it probably would have made a difference whether they did only forward or or forward and backward and that's kind of what you see here uh what else this one also does not have uh an MLP so they have a bunch of these uh, blocks stacked on top of each other but interestingly they uh, remove the MLP here so basically unlike a vision transformer which has these MLP blocks after the attention blocks and in this paper it's the same thing after the uh, equivalent of the attention blocks these like Mamba blocks they have a little MLP block and then they have a bunch of those in a row right or stacked this one does not have that they get rid of that MLP so they only have uh, what they call VSS blocks I call them just Mamba blocks generically but they discard that which means they can fit more of them together so I think that's most of the differences in terms of the two things this one also uses the Silu activations which I thought was kind of cool you know but I don't think that's necessarily a big part of their performance but when it comes to actually performance itself we did compare so these both of these papers we got lucky and both of them use the three same benchmarks so they basically use ImageNet 1K which is a classification benchmark right so image to uh, category they use COCO which is an object detection benchmark uh, which is basically uh, bounding boxes this is COCO on uh, papers with code so showing you how over the years we've gotten better and better at COCO and then the last benchmark that they use is a semantic segmentation benchmark which is a dense task right where you basically have to basically classify every single pixel into some limited set of categories and here's the uh, benchmark of 8020k over the years so in 2015 the best thing we had was this FCN and now we have a one piece I love the name of that exploring general representation that's a pretty awesome paper look at that one piece current record ho holder for uh, ADE 20k um, but we got lucky both of them both of them use the same uh, benchmark so we can directly compare them and uh, the vmamba is a little bit better so vmamba for the same uh, model size so here or the same it's difficult because the model sizes are slightly different but here we have image size of 224 by 224 22 million parameters and you get uh, 82 image net accuracy versus here we have uh, image net 1k we have vim s 224 by 224 26 million parameters 80 so even with a little bit more parameters it still doesn't quite get image net 1k now performance on these benchmarks is not indicative of performance on some downstream task that is of interest to you right these benchmarks are a little bit sketchy a little fuzzy like at some point plus minus two three point percentage points on these benchmarks doesn't necessarily mean a whole lot really you're just looking to see to make sure that they're kind of roughly about the same as some of these other model architectures so the fact that it performs a little bit uh, better or vmamba is a little bit better than vision mamba or vim doesn't necessarily mean anything but I don't know I guess it's a point uh, I think this one is a little bit faster though so this one is faster especially if they got rid of the bi-directional it would be even more faster so we don't really have a way to directly compare the speed here directly comparing speed is very difficult because some models are work better on certain types of hardware versus other types of hardware right even if you change things such as uh, the size of different 
uh, memory parts in the GPU. So here they, I think it was this paper, they looked at different, yeah, the relative high bandwidth memory versus SRAM, right? Different memory caches on your GPU, right? You can you can design your model architecture to take advantage of that stuff. So it's not like you could load both of these on your GPU and then say definitively that this one is faster than the other one, right? It could just be the case that this one is faster on your GPU, but then if you used a different GPU, it would be faster on that GPU, right? So speed is hard to compare, but I think this one is a little bit faster. And that's pretty much it. So I think the last metric that we're going to judge them on is uh, which snake was cuter. So let's compare them. We have this snake, and then we have this snake. All right, so we're going to need your input here. Do we have Vision Mamba Snake or V Mamba Snake? Vision Mamba, V Mamba. I kind of like this one. I feel like this one looks a little cuter, right? It's got a little shininess in the eyes. It's kind of got like a, a bigger, the eyes relative to the head is a little cuter. Yeah, I kind of like this one. Okay. So, we're going to give the win to that one. The Battle of the Mambas, V Mamba won. It got a little bit better performance. I thought this was a little bit cooler, the cross scan module, and they have the cuter snake. So that's my official my official result is that V Mamba is the winner of the Battle of the Mambas. <laughs> Hope that was entertaining and interesting. Hope you learned something. Uh, if you want to continue this discussion, feel free to join our Discord. And uh, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Spyro, Aries, Nathan, Josh, Maxa, Nate, Kalina, Stalin, Black People. <laughs> Aries, you guys have weird ass names. I don't know why I'm saying your names out loud. 87GN, ASDF, Josh, Niso, 2AX, Josh, more Josh, Eclipse, Wool, A Fool. Everybody, thanks for listening and have a great weekend. Mm -hmm.